Yes, children. Let us continue further. We saw the preparation of alkanes, alkenes and alkynes. Now let's go one by one. The physical and chemical properties of alkanes, alkenes and alkynes. So let us first start with physical properties of alkanes. And then we'll slowly move on to chemical. Now under physical properties of alkanes. You will find that the first four members are gases. And then the fifth member to 17th member they are liquids and then they are waxy solids higher members are waxy solids okay now the next property is boiling point boiling point increases with increase in molecular mass okay as in when the molecular mass increases boiling point will also increase why because of the increase in van der waals force of attraction between the molecules the force of attraction between the molecules will increase with increase in molecular mass but now for isomeric alkanes boiling point decreases with increase in branching now what happens with the branching now we take this example this is pentane this is isopentane this is neopentane now you see this is look at the size it is like this now slowly ब्रांचिंग की वजह से ये थोड़ा सा साइज कम हो गया और ये देखो इट इज टोटली बिकम स्फेरिकल एग्जैक्टली है नाउ यू नो वेरी वेल दैट बिटवीन टू स्फीयर्स द एरिया ऑफ कॉन्टैक्ट इज मिनिमम राइट सो व्हाट हैपेंस द इंटरमोलिकुलर फोर्सेस विल बी वीक सो बॉइलिंग पॉइंट विल बी लेस ओके सो बॉइलिंग पॉइंट increases sorry boiling point decreases with increase in branching why because surface area decreases so area of contact decreases so van der waals force of interaction also becomes weak and hence the boiling point is also decreasing so remember with increase in branching boiling point decreases 309 301 282 it is decreasing now melting point we'll see further melting point increases with increase in molecular mass now they have found that the variation is not regular like how you say for boiling point it is not like this here but then when you're talking about melting point that means you are considering only solid alkenes the alkenes which are in the form of solids only for solids melting point is a valid property now here what happens alkanes with even number of carbon atoms have higher melting point than those with odd number of carbon atoms alkanes with even number of carbon atoms have higher melting point than those with odd number of carbon atoms now what is this property called this is called as alternation effect now look what is the structure now i have given two taken examples of two compounds one is hexane which is having even number of carbon atoms and the other one is pentane which is having odd number of carbon atoms now generally these uh, molecules they are found to be in a zigzag fashion so in that case you will find that the first carbon and the sixth carbon they are in opposite planes okay here it is and here sixth carbon so they are found to be in opposite planes but you see those alkanes in which the number of carbon atoms are odd you will find that the end carbon atoms are in the same plane now what happens if they are in opposite planes it will fit into the lattice properly lattice is nothing but the solid structure in which the molecule is packed okay now if it is in opposite planes the crystal lattice is supposed to be stronger okay that is why this will have higher melting point whereas if they are in the same plane then there is more of repulsive forces with the result the melting point is lower okay so you always have to remember this melting point is higher for 
alkanes having even number of carbon atoms than those for odd number of carbon atoms. Now come to solubility. Now you know very well that alkanes are non-polar. Okay. CH bonds they are non-polar. So they are insoluble in polar solvents such as water but they are soluble in non-polar solvents such as benzene, carbon tetrachloride, chloroform, all these things. Right? Okay. Now let's come to chemical properties. Now under chemical properties, we are going to study the properties under different headings. What are they? Substitution. Under substitution you have halogenation, nitration, sulfonation. Then you have oxidation. Under oxidation again you have three types. One is complete oxidation which you call it as combustion. Then incomplete combustion and then catalytic oxidation. Now catalytic oxidation, the name itself is telling you that it is taking place in the presence of a catalyst. Incomplete combustion means when the amount of oxygen that is supplied is insufficient. Combustion that is complete oxidation where the fuel and oxygen are in proper proportion that is complete combustion is taking place. Okay. Now look here CH4 plus 2O2 that is in the ratio of 1 is to 2 and here it is in the ratio of 2 is to 3. How much it should be if it was to be complete then it should have been 2 is to 4 but here it is 2 is to 3 that means there is insufficient oxygen. So because of insufficient oxygen the product formed is not CO2 but CO. Here it is CO2 but in complete combustion may it is carbon monoxide. Now when you come to catalytic oxidation, methane is subjected to oxidation in the presence of copper as a catalyst at 100 atmosphere and 573 Kelvin when you get methanol. Now in a different, using a different catalyst then the product that may be formed that may be aldehyde, right. So this catalyst it is highly specific in the presence of a particular catalyst you will get only only one type of product okay all the catalysts will not give the same product so they are highly specific in nature catalysts are highly specific all these catalysts they have two properties what are they one is activity and selectivity okay activity is nothing but a catalyst initiates a particular reaction Selectivity is that it will direct the reaction towards the formation of a particular product. So that is one uh, ultimate capacity of a catalyst. Okay. So in the presence of copper you will get methanol. If you use some other like molybdenum oxide, oxide and all that then you may get formaldehyde here. Anyway, so you just need to know the difference. Then the next property is isomerization. Isomerization means what? Isomers are formed. Like N-butane is getting converted into isobutane. Now this is taking place in the presence of AlCl3. This is considered to be an isomerizing agent. Okay. So N-butane is also C4H10. Isobutane is also C4H10. So this is called isomerization. One particular isomer is converted into another. Then aromatization. N-hexane. N-hexane is CH3, CH2 four times CH3. So total of six carbon atoms are there. This is hexane. Now hexane is first converted into cyclohexane. And then cyclohexane gets converted to benzene. Benzene is C6H6. This is C6H12. This is C6H14. Okay. This is aromatization. A simple alkane is converted into an aromatic compound. That is called as aromatization. Then pyrolysis. 
pyro pyro means fire okay so here when higher alkanes are heated then you get a mixture of lower alkanes say for example you start with hexane you may get uh, say ethene and butane so like that you will get a mixture of alkanes lower alkanes that is called as pyrolysis pyrolysis lysis means breaking pyro means in the presence of heat so when you heat higher alkanes you will get a mixture of lower alkanes okay so these are the chemical properties <laughs> now we'll see in detail about substitution alone right now under substitution what you have you have halogenation nitration sulfonation we saw now under halogenation fluorine chlorine bromine iodine these are halogens you know it so these are the reacting agents now the reactivity of halogens are in this order f2 more reactive than chlorine more reactive than bromine more reactive than iodine now the reaction with fluorine is highly vigorous and it is of no practical significance so we are not going to see this we are going to see chlorine bromine and iodine now chlorine is also reactive bromine is comparatively less reactive and iodine it is least reactive now you have studied in 10th class that methane when it is subjected to chlorination first you will get methyl chloride this is done in the presence of sunlight heat or sunlight you will get methyl chloride on further chlorination you will get dichloromethane then on further chlorination you will get trichloromethane and then on further chlorination you will get tetrachloromethane this you have studied in 10th class right now the mechanism of this halogenation is by free radical mechanism now you know what are free radicals now which is the reagent that you are adding you are adding chlorine now chlorine in the presence of sunlight or uv light it breaks into two chlorine free radicals cl dot means free radical this is chain initiation then comes chain propagation now how this free radical is reacting now this free radical they are all highly reactive species they are highly reactive mm -hmm. species now this is hitting a methane molecule okay now what will it do this chlorine radical this will try to break this ch bond one of the ch bond now when it breaks what happens the electrons will go towards the respective atoms okay so what it will do it will take up this h dot and form hcl leaving behind a methyl free radical now this methyl free radical that will become a reactive species now it will hit one more chlorine molecule present in the medium and it will make this break into two cl free radicals out of which one cl free radical will be produced as a product and the other cl radical will combine with this c dot forming methyl chloride right and then the next step is chain termination now during chain termination what happens now so many things are there inside the medium two chlorine free radicals because yahan pe chlorine free radical form hua na so there may be more and more of chlorine free radical in the medium they may combine to form chlorine molecule or this methyl free radical free radical which was formed this might not have got converted into methyl chloride jo bache hue hain wo aapas mein react ho ke ethane bhi produce kar sakta hai aapas mein ye jo dono electrons pair honge so you'll get ethane or this ch3 dot may combine with cl dot forming chloromethane also all possibilities are there okay now this is one reason why during chlorination ethane is produced as a by product because of this mechanism 
but then you will find iodination is reversible. Bromination also takes place but to a lesser extent. Iodination is reversible. So whenever you want to have iodination process, you have to do it in the presence of an oxidizing agent such as either HNO3 or HIO3, iodic acid or nitric acid. These are strong oxidizing agents. So what they will do when iodination is done, you will get iodoalkane plus HI. Jisko replace karega, ek I uske saath HI ban ke aega. Now this HI is a reducing agent. So if you leave it as it is, what will happen? It will reverse the reaction. So you will get back alkane again. So if you want to prevent the reverse reaction to take place, what you have to do? You have to do an oxidizing. You have to add an oxidizing agent. Now supposing HiO3 is added, it will react with the byproduct HI and convert it into iodine. So this iodine will further react with another molecule of alkane. Okay. Same way nitric acid can also be used. If nitric acid is used, then HI will react with HNO3 giving rise to I2 plus NO2 plus water. This will be formed. So I2 will again react with another molecule of alkane, right?